Anyway, there's lots to get to. Let's get to it first. Danielle Smith. Danielle Smith is saying Alberta sovereignty first, our electricity grid first. Uh, Paul says historic news to protect Albertans and the Alberta electricity grid. The Danielle Smith government has introduced a motion in the legislature to invoke the Alberta Sovereignty Act with the purpose of overriding Ottawa's 2035 net zero electricity regulations. So this is going to be, a, we're 2023. This is a 2025, 2035 target this is going to be a long fight. This is this is going to be quite annoying, I think. Anyway, here's Danielle Smith. If the federal government has its way, many people will be left without electricity that they can pay for on a power grid that will fall short or even fail in a typical Alberta winter or summer. We refuse to go along with this plan. Well, Britons must have access to affordable and reliable power when and where they need it. It's a matter of health and safety and a matter of financial reality. No one should have to choose between paying their utility bills or buying needed groceries. But it's also a matter of law. As I mentioned earlier, the Constitution is clear. Electricity is a provincial responsibility. Natural gas is the foundation of our electricity system in Alberta, and it will be for decades to come. If we don't have enough natural gas baseload power in the coming years, we will have brownouts and blackouts in the dead of winter and in the hottest days of summer, and electricity prices will be astronomical. It's simply too massive a risk for Albertans and Alberta businesses, and it's a risk that we are facing thanks to Ottawa. So Alberta's government... So... Government must act. We can't put the stability of our electricity grid at risk. This is why we're introducing a resolution under the Alberta Sovereignty within the United Canada Act. So, sorry, I cut in a little early there. First thing that I want to say about this video is how tall is this guy? Holy, like, he is ridiculously tall. It is, it's like Mr. Hom in here. Um, <laughs> Danielle Smith is right. Ottawa is overreaching, and it'll be interesting to see, like, this is the very first step in this whole process of saying, we have jurisdiction, we have this law here also to underpin that jurisdiction, and we are going to act in our own best interest, Ottawa, despite what you say. And Ottawa is going to challenge that, and the courts are stacked in a way that, uh, I don't know if it benefits Ottawa or if it benefits Alberta. I would say if I were to hazard a guess, there's probably a little bit of an Ottawa slant in the courts these days, but I mean, I'm sure somebody could make an argument somewhere. Um, so what happened? And I mean, Alberta's lost court cases that mattered previously. They, they said that Ottawa did not have the authority to put a price on carbon, a nationwide price on carbon, and the, the Supreme Court of Canada disagreed, so Alberta lost that one. So I would imagine there's going to be legislature or there, excuse me, um, litigation uh, that is going to come down and, and challenge this, um, probably, right? But I think that legally and with, with regards to how our governance documents le read, I think that they're within their rights to assert their independence and ability to govern their, their resources and electricity grid and things like that. I believe that she's right. And I believe that if you read things honestly, and if it was an, if it was an impartial court, uh, then I think the winner is obvious. But then you think, but it's 2023 in Canada. So the impartial court and the objective, the objectivity of the court is, is, in question, no doubt, right? So that's when you got to get people who, you know, maybe maybe a giant to go in there and intimidate people, right? Make sure that they understand they better they better be impartial or else. He's really tall. Uh, Rupa says, <laughs> not very surprising. So is there an election coming up? Justin Trudeau's changing his comms manager and his the new comms manager is Max V. And I'm sorry that I'm terrible about names, but Max V is the best we're going to get today. And he's a marketer, consultant, speaker, author, TV person. You get politics, food, sports, culture, and some arguing he, him. You know the politics is going to absolutely be a wet noodle when they identify as he, him. Like that brittle star guy. Oh my God. It's not even... I can't even cringe my way through it. I just feel sorry for everybody involved and everybody laughing. It's terrible. Anyway, Rupa says, not very inspiring when Justin Trudeau's new comms director has spent all day blocking people and has protected his account. So what kind of comms director is he going to be? Only speaking to the choir, pretty dumb, arrogant, and not to mention really bad optics from Trudeau and company. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really good comm director. Block them, block them. Ah, put my, hide my tweets. <laughs> 
perfect, right? It, Brian Lilly, again, he says, when, you, when you're down 15 points in the polls and start claiming that your very normal opponent is effectively Donald Trump, then you may have lost the plot. This is where Justin Trudeau is with Pierre Polyev. Trudeau is desperate, and here's why. This feels like a recycled headline. They, being the powers that be, and I think Brian Lilly's even participated in all of this, have pilloried people as Trumpian, Trump-like, Trump-ish, Trumpy, whatever it is. There's all sorts of ways to backhandedly call somebody uh, Trumpian. And right now, that spells Trudeau's desperation. And yesterday or the other day before, this is probably shopping the same, the same thing. But he was, he was talking about how Trudeau and his clan of people are desperate. And I mean, they are absolutely cratering in the polls. That's good. But polls are meant to influence people. Remember when Justin Trudeau got a large majority, right? And it feels like we're going for a Pierre Polyev large majority. And what does he want to do? Build 15-minute cities and import doctors and nurses from foreign, foreign places. It's, it's the same. You're getting off the red bus and getting onto the blue bus. It's the same destination. It's just a different vehicle-ish, right? And so, I don't know. So I don't know if it spells desperation. Um, and I'm not convinced that the elections themselves are above board because there are a lot of reasons to doubt the results. Ken says, beyond troubling to see another mass shooting in Canada. Hold on. I'll give you an idea of who Ken is first because we need to understand this. Ken is a liberal member of parliament for Fleetwood Port Kells riding in Surrey, B.C., and he's a writer and a broadcaster and a public servant, he says. And he says, beyond troubling to see another mass shooting in Canada, now in Winnipeg, and we've lost so many police officers, might it be the anti-social burn everything down far right attitude we're seeing creeping in from the US and the creep on the Canadian side, Pierre Polyev? Is this guy blaming Pierre Polyev for the Winnipeg shooting? And wasn't there recently a gangland execution of a father and son in like broad daylight or something like that was that winnipeg or was that in in calgary i think it was Win i think it was winnipeg but i, I could be wrong i could be misremembering mis that um but it is it, it's very interesting um to have an, a sitting member of parliament suggest something like that seems very very strange seems brazen or stupid both Sam Cooper, let's talk about China very quick, says, I'm not insinuating that the PMO of Trudeau has been the subject of PRC interference. I'm asserting that credible sources say so, and the evidence, supp evidence supports that. Happy Monday. And he carries on. He says, and from what I see from the outside of RCMP investigations, they're making direct connections between CCP police stations and major party backers, more than one party. Today's story was a good 50,000 foot overview of Canada's vulnerability. So if you've got CCP agents plugged into the party, the, the back end of the party, the um, donors and the, the money-making side of things, if you know what I'm saying, if your entire existence relies on donations from the CCP, then you owe your existence and election to the CCP and therefore they own you. Yes right? And so that's, I mean, that's interesting. That's interesting. How, how many ways can you rig an election is getting foreign donations one of the biggest, right? And Justin Trudeau, didn't he hold a fundraiser outside of the country uh, when he wasn't supposed to, and then nobody would report on that? I think that, I think that maybe he did. Um, Blacklock's reporter is reporting this. Attorney General um, Avery, Averian Arif, sorry, I forgot that wrong, dismisses uh, all party demands to unmask China agents. Barry's common committee calls for registry of foreign agents until after the next election. So there's Arif Verini. That's his, that's his name. That's the attorney general. This guy looks very young. Very, very young. Very interesting, his positioning, right? Very interesting indeed. And so when all of this China stuff comes out, well, the liberals do everything they can to bury it. And the attorney general... Is willing to play ball this time, right? DPA for SNC Lavalin, you sh you bet for sure. Larry Brock is going after the ghost companies. This is just establishing a baseline, but I think that it's worthwhile to remember. Here's Larry Brock. 
uh, Deputy Commissioner Larkin, uh, all my questions will be directed towards you. Uh, you'll agree that there are basic legal tenets under criminal law, namely that ignorance of the law is no excuse, that every Canadian is certainly not above the law, that includes all members of Parliament and the Prime Minister himself. Would you agree with that? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that's the foundation of uh, democracy and the democratic uh, institutions that we provide support to and enforce the Criminal Code of Canada and other jurisdictional laws such as provincial and or municipal. Thank you. So there you go. Uh, that's the whole underpinning of our democracy. I just think it's interesting. Uh, Larry, Larry Brock is um, making the case that even the prime minister could be held to account for criminality, right? <laughs> Ignorance of the law is no excuse, and every Canadian, including Justin Trudeau himself, is not above the law. Uh, so we'll see where he goes with this. I don't know. I don't know. We're not very good at prosecuting anybody and holding anybody accountable for anything in Canada, not even a little tiny bit. Dan McTeague is fed up with these liberals. Dan's a former liberal himself, back when liberals were centrists and somewhat sane. Patty Haydu is unhinged. And Dan says so. He says it, he's responding to Patty Haydu. And Patty Haydu says, reckless Canada deserves better. And well, should we listen to it? It's 19 seconds. I'm glad she's not the health minister anymore. I've got to be honest with you. Let's listen to 19 seconds of Patty Haydu. I bet you she's talking about Pierre Polyev. During question period, I heard in one of the questions from the leader of the opposition his reckless use of the word crazy as a pejorative for one of our cabinet ministers. <laughs> Or will he keep his crazy environment minister? Could be crazy, but he's a crazy man. During question period. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, anyway, Dan McTeague says, except that you and your colleagues are in fact nuts and destroying this great country with your woke obsessions. Signed, a real liberal who never heard of you before 2014, Trudeau interloper. And my hubby says, speaking of crazy, listen to Christia Freeland. This is pure craziness. Now, uh, James Lindsay recently, and I, I plug his stuff all the time, but if you want to know what's going on right now and how the communists are structuring their fight, James Lindsay is breaking it down weekly, honestly, in the bullets and everything else. But James Lindsay talks about how normalizing craziness, he did this, I think it was the Edmonton talk. He was talking about how normalizing mental health days and craziness and being around children was done in order to um, destabilize. And then this, the next step was that if you if you stood up against this, well, it's too much to get into right now. Um, but it was it was like a two hour talk, and three quarters of the way through, I'm nodding along, and he's done a really good job at isolating particular ideas and then weaving them all together to to give a very robust understanding about how. Um, they utilize, they, they try and normalize the use of being crazy or being mentally unstable, mel mentally unwell, but still being allowed or even being preferable to being around children because for some reason that's better for children to expose them to this. And it is, it is done specifically to further the woke agenda, the communist agenda in this case. Um, so I just think it's, very interesting, very interesting stuff. Anyway, to speak about craziness, because calling somebody crazy is maybe not nice, but it's not something that we need to focus on in the House of Commons. Um, here is Christia Freeland dodging questions like liberals do, and it's terrible, and she's terrible. It's, she's terrible. There's no other way to say it. Here we go. Rich to take you, this you laid time. out in the beginning of the meeting that, you know, um, we should give time to answer the questions. That has nothing to do with the question... And I would, I would indulge you to take a look at what kind of relevance okay. her answer has to the question at hand. Thank you for that point of order. Yes, Minister, to be relevant. And it was Hold on a second. I believe that that wasn't the... Here's, here's the lead up. Here's, here's before that point of order. Here's the question and the non-answer. And I think it's important to have intellectual honesty in this conversation. I'm asking you about GDP per capita. Canada's population has swelled in recent years, which has masked our GDP per capita, which is per individual. Each Canadian is getting poorer. They're getting poorer, Minister. This is an issue. So I'm asking you again, just a number. What was, GD what was GDP per capita in the first quarter, the second quarter, or the third quarter? Any quarter. Mr. Lawrence. 
you and I actually have had very respectful exchanges, and I'm grateful for that. But I have to say, after your leader's performance last week, where he jumped to accusations of terrorism, alarming all Canadians, and after the vote of your party to fail to support Ukraine, order, it is a Point bit order, rich to take you, this You laid time. out in the beginning of the meeting that, you know, um, we should give time to answer the questions. What's the GDP per capita? I love our relationship, Lawrence. But it's really rich to ask me that question when you don't support Ukraine. What? Okay. Is the finance minister feeling all right? Dan Albus, who is a current, who's a current MP, and I think he's a shadow minister, or he's a shadow cabinet person. CPC, Central Okanagan. No, he is not. So I thought he, I thought he was. Maybe he was higher up than somebody else's. Um, but he is an MP. And he says, the role of the finance minister under Trudeau has become the minister of spending, full stop, nonstop. And I showed this to you yesterday, but this is Vasi Kapolis asking Christia Freeland about fiscal anchors, et cetera, et cetera. And again, Freeland goes on this quest of saying, thanks for asking that question, Vasi. And then she proceeds to not answer any of the questions that she was asked, right? And it's a very, it's a very interesting um, strategy. And I think that Freeland's strategy really is to just bore you into submission. She just she just wants to talk long enough so that you stop paying attention and or forget what the heck she was talking, what question she was supposed to answer in the first place. Here's Tim Houston, and he is the premier of Nova Scotia. And this piece is from the Niagara Independent, and it says, Houston must cut up taxpayer credit card. Nova Scotia's premier, Tim Houston, is driving his province toward a fiscal cliff. If he doesn't change course soon, taxpayers will be in for a world of hurt. Houston didn't inherit a rosy financial situation in the previous Liberal government's final budget before Houston won the 2021 election. Former premier Ian Rankin announced plans to spend $12.4 billion and run a $585 million deficit. But not long after Houston entered the Premier's office, government, governments across Canada started to enjoy a tax windfall triggered by soaring inflation. The Nova Scotia government's revenue increased by $2.4 billion, more than double the inflation rate during Houston's first two years in office. Balancing the books should have been a walk in the park. Instead of seizing an opportunity to get Nova Scotia's finances back in order, Houston unleashed a spending binge that would make the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau blush. In 24 months, Houston increased government spending by more than 18%, nearly doubled the inflation rate. Houston ballooned Nova Scotia's debt by $1.7 billion over the past two years and plans to increase it by an additional $3.7 billion over the next three years. That means by the time Tim Houston has completed his first five years in office, Nova Scotia debt will have grown by $5.4 billion and will have hit $23.2 billion. That's about $23,000 per person. For comparison's sake, during the same two-year period, Tim Houston increased Nova Scotia's debt by $1.7 billion. New Brunswick decreased the province's debt by roughly $2 billion. Exploding debt was never inevitable. It was the result of Houston's policy choices. Ah, see, back to the bad policies argument, right? And anybody who looks at this says, I think they're meaning to do this, right? When Houston ran for premier in 2021, he promised to spend more on health care and told taxpayers to accept modest deficits as a consequence. I'm comfortable running deficits in the short term in order to make investments needed in health care, Houston told Nova Scotians. The truth is that Houston is playing the health care card to justify massive new spending across the board. But maybe. Tim Houston government will spend $4.8 billion this year on health care. That's $700 million more than the ranking government spent in 21. So um, do you think that the premiers are spending in a fiscally responsible way? I don't think anybody is. And one of the things I was going to say is if you get hit with a tax windfall, now like having your house in order is something like an, an example of having your house in order is you've owned your house, hypothetical situation. You've owned your, your house for 15 years and you had a 25 year mortgage. So it's paid down, let's say a third of the way. You're pretty, you're pretty good. So you've got a, about a hundred thousand dollars in, um, in care in housing costs plus you know rent or excuse me uh taxes and and any kind of uh, repairs things like that maintenance costs so it'll be a little bit more but the mortgage itself is is relatively low so having your house in order means if the interest rate goes to 10 percent, you're not going to lose your house now same person if they don't have their house in order, maybe they got their house 15 years ago, and instead of the mortgage being $100,000, so you know a third left in the in the price or in the paying down of the house, um, you actually still owe 
almost exactly what you originally borrowed, right? Like, let's say it was $600,000 because it was 15 years ago and it was a nice house. Um, let's say it was $500,000, half a million, just to make it easy. Um, and let's say after that, all of that time, you've used your house as kind of a bank and, and you've spent a lot of money, lived beyond your means, but it's always been okay because you've just put it onto the mortgage and, and you know, it's fine. Um, so while you may have paid down some in the earlier days, you bought a car and that, you know, that screwed things up or added whatever. And now the interest rate goes up by 10% and now things are looking not so good. So there is benefit and I can see the benefit. I'm not trying to argue there's not benefit to having your financial house in order. I'm not arguing that. I want to make that clear. But in a situation like provinces and the rest, it seems like the people who benefit politically are the ones who spend and kind of throw care about it it to the to the wind they don't care caution to the wind that's it ha. um <laughs> and and so that's weird like you've got the two examples here of houston who's spending money and i, I would imagine that's popular in nova scotia but i could be wrong because not many people look at the balance sheet and go 3.5 billion that's a lot of money nobody cares right if the if the um health is good but i don't think the health care is good and i think the milk is expensive and that's a problem so is the right move if you are in a situation where um, you get a $2.4 billion revenue increase, is the right move to spend that increase or is the right move to, to pay down debt, right? If you spend it, maybe you generate economic activity that's more than the $2.4 billion and, and whatever. So there's, there's all sorts of arguments, et cetera. But it, it's interesting to me to look at things through the lens of like, what is, what is really the right what is really the right thing to do here? I don't know what correlates long-term, like over the five years out for making a decision like that, paying down debt or you know investing in and trying to generate three times the, two times, whatever, the ROAS, the return on money spent. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the right thing to do. And I don't know, uh, I don't know how to, if it's properly measured, with regards to when you make a decision like that, if you can track like we did this for this outcome, did we achieve the outcome? I don't think you can say we did this, was this the right move and like track the alternate because you didn't do the alternate. So there's gonna be variables that are not real in, in something that you're not tracking. But if you have very clear clear cut goals and not spend 2.4 billion, but like if we spend 2.4 billion, we're expecting 4.8 billion of economic activity in this in this scope within this time period within this blah, 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 blah. Um, right like but i don't know what the best choice is anyway i just thought it was an interesting um, kind of case study on macro economies right like mac much more macro than like my budget my household budget or even a business budget anyway moving on <laughs> actually not really moving on we're sticking with money so contrarian says calgary liberal mayor just increased property taxes by another 7.8 percent at a time when people are struggling so that might be a macro impact on if you spend all the time and you come to a situation where the proverbial shit hits the fan like the, this shit hit the fan is not interest rates rise but something happens in the municipality like they need to put up a, a nonsensical looking statue of garbage or something like that um, and they raise your property taxes by 10 percent for no reason at all they need to build a library why for no reason but you have to pay for the library right so <laughs> The Guelph Library thing has been a contentious issue for years. And now they've, they agreed to build it three years ago. I think it was a $65 million library. And the pro-library people are like, this is the best possible use of $65 million you could possibly get. And the, the against library people are saying, this is the most insane way to spend $65 million. $65 million? Are you in a building? Are you kidding me? No. What? Who approved this? And then, I mean, they become more incoherent after that. <laughs> Calgary Herald is reporting, city, Calgary City Council approves 7.8% tax hike in 2024. Calgary City Council votes 9 to 6 in favor of 2024 budget adjustments, which include shifting more of the tax burden onto residential ratepayers. Good luck, residential ratepayers. Also, here's one, tab, one bit of news that I don't have a tab for. The Mayor Chow negotiated with Doug Ford for Doug Ford to take over maintenance of the Gardner and the DVP. So, I mean, I think that the Gardner and the DVP are provincial highways, so it makes perfect sense to me. Like, Guelph doesn't 
manage the Hanlon. The Hanlon is a terrible little road. With, it, it's a 70 kilometer speed limit with lights every kilometer, also an overpass <laughs> right in the middle for no reason, but just one overpass. It goes light, 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 overpass, light, light, light. <laughs> And then way, way, way out, kind of by the 401, maybe another overpass. It's the most ridiculous road ever, that I, ever. But it's a provincial highway. And so Guelph doesn't pay for it. And so Olivia Chow uploaded those, those costs from Toronto to um, the province. And now she's saying that they've got more for health care. I was like, does she understand that health care is... Never mind. You go, Olivia Chow. She's a communist, right? She's a communist. Um, so Calgary rate shifting for um, the burden to be more on taxpayers, ratepayers. Good job, right? This is, this is a great outcome. It's not, it's not. And it's unfortunate because it's all done by bad policies. Camus says, rising cost of living forcing immigrants to leave Canada. The skyrocketing cost of living is difficult for people who have lived in Canada for a long time and for newcomers. Well, the people who just got here and they go, holy cow, have you seen the price of bananas? I'm going home, right? We can't do that. Bananas used to be reasonable here. Actually, I think they're exactly the same. They're 59 cents a uh, kilogram, 59 cents a pound, whatever it is. Um, but even so, the cost of everything else is skyrocket. Pe peanut butter, much more expensive. Um, the immigrants are the plight of the news, CTV news, right? It's not, it's not for the people who live in Canada. It's not for the people. Skyrock. It's not for the people who, you know, built their lives here and invested in this country and, and have done everything they can to, to make sure that, uh, you know, their lives and their family's life is enriched by the country they live in, health care for everybody, mental health supports for people, support for people who lose their jobs, you know, all these social safety net things. No, no, all of that's terrible, apparently. We're awful, awful, terrible people for doing that. We have to support the immigrants. That's what CTV News is doing. What? Rocket and cost of living is difficult for both people who've lived in Canada for a long time and for newcomers. That means some people who chose to move to this country are now making other plans. CTV's Jumi Ogunshola reports tonight on the difficult decisions some immigrants are now making to leave. Walking along the seawall, Malika Azizi appears to have a great life. But, this <laughs> but digging a little deeper, once she gets into the grocery store. Holly Doan is reporting Liberal MP on Commons Government Operations Committee opposes public disclosure of contracts with EV battery manufacturers. It's important we maintain confidentiality. So all of these EV battery manufacturers have taken billions of our Canadian tax dollars and they're gonna to put together battery plants. And I think within, within five years, by 2028, I don't think that we're gonna be using lithium batteries for cars. I don't, I don't think so. Maybe Tesla's will still, unless they've come up with some new battery technology. But I really don't think that we will be using lithium ion batteries for cars. And I think we'll possibly look back at what we're doing now as a, with car batteries as a waste of the resources that we should have focused on like phones and laptops and things like that. But I could be wrong about that, who knows. But I don't think, as far as I understand it, you can't take a lithium ion battery and then restructure it into, like you can't take a car battery and then turn that into 10 laptop batteries or however many laptop batteries would fit, right? I don't think that you can do that. Um, so it would be better to just use the resources directly the right, to, the right way the first time. Uh, but Hello everyone, thanks very much for watching. This is just a short version of a longer show. If you'd like to get the whole show, you can go over to canadapoly.com and sign up for a subscription. Just look in the drop down tab for shop and donate and look for subscriptions and you'll get immediate access to the full show. Love to see you. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.